just saw all these bodies everywhere and no explanation. That's when I started trying to figure out what had happened. Saw a wounded person, got on the radio, called for help. The captain just put his weapon on automatic and killed her. This is one of the commanding officers mm -hmm. on the ground. Commanding officer. It appeared that something was going very wrong that we couldn't understand. Next time we landed in a ditch that had over 100 bodies in it. Some of them weren't dead yet. So I asked for help again, and I asked him, I said, can you help these people out? And the soldier said, yeah, we'll help them out of their misery. And that's when I just told him, quit joking around, help them out, okay? They said, yeah. One of the things that galvanized the anti-war movement during the Vietnam War in the United States more than anything was the My Lai Massacre. A brigade of American soldiers went into the village of My Lai, undefended, no weapons, made up of elderly people and children, went in there and killed 350 to 500 civilians, mutilated bodies, gang rape before killing, killed every animal in there, burned the fields, an appalling atrocity appalling in part because the U.S. government covered it up for a year, appalling because when it finally had to admit it, it handed out just a slap on the wrist to the commanding officer, and appalling because almost certainly this was not the only instance of that. On the right is a man named Hugh Thompson. This is the man who stopped the My Lai massacre. People suffer in war. I can't answer what it accomplishes. I have very mixed feelings about it. I sure don't want to be in another one, because I know what goes on. Thompson was a helicopter pilot. He was piloting a gunship that was flying over the village, and he had gotten reports of shooting there, assumed that American troops were under attack from Viet Cong, flew over, landed there to see what help he could give, got out of the helicopter, and saw American troops shooting old women in the head saw American troops pulling babies underneath from out of their dead mothers to kill them, and this man saw what was happening. And at that point, there was a small surviving number of villagers huddling at one end of the village and a group of American soldiers coming towards them, and this man got in his helicopter and landed it in between the two, and he trained his machine guns on the American soldiers and said, if you make one more move, I will mow you down. In other words, over the course of minutes, he had completely changed who was an us and who was a them. And as we took off, my crew chiefs came over the intercom with the most somber voice I'd ever heard saying, my God, they're firing into the ditch. Thompson and his crew then realized the American troops were on a killing spree. Talking wasn't working. I had to take action. When he saw GIs advancing on another group of defenseless women and children, Thompson ordered his crew to turn their guns on their fellow Americans. He landed the aircraft in between the American forces and the Vietnamese people got out of the aircraft and he went and had words with a lieutenant on the ground. These are human beings! Unarmed civilians! The lieutenant outranked him, but he gave the lieutenant an order and told him to keep his people in place. Get back! With the aid of larger helicopter gunships, Hugh Thompson and his crew succeeded in airlifting to safety over a dozen old men, women, and children. Well, I did instruct my crew to open up on them if they open up on any more civilians. That particular day, I wouldn't have given it a second thought. The soldier's trained to kill, but a soldier's not trained to murder. You have to do the right thing in life, but don't look for any rewards. Thompson was grilled in Congress over the charge that he trained his helicopter's guns on U.S. troops. I'd been threatened with prison. A life had been threatened. I was an outcast. He was called a rat and a traitor by fellow servicemen. But over the course of time, Thompson began to be seen as a hero. Thirty years after Me Lai, Hugh Thompson and his crew received the Soldier's Medal, the Army's highest award for bravery. U.S. Senator John Bro nominated Thompson for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2000. Thompson was widely recognized not just for his battlefield courage, but for his humanity. Hello, ma'am. Nice to meet you. Thank you for me. She had been dumped in the ditch but survived, shielded by the bodies of the dead. Why, she wanted to know, were so many villagers killed that day? And why was Thompson different from the rest of the Americans? I saved the people because I wouldn't talk to murder and kill. I just wish we could have helped more people that day. In fact, they did help more people. Some scholars say 
we saved upwards of 20,000 lives because that operation was supposed to go on for four days and there's up to 20,000 people lived in all those villages. You know, I've always heard though saying, I thought it was kind of corny, but you can make a difference. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I guess I proved you can make a difference. And the main point of all of these people is none of them have any brain regions that us, that we don't have. None of them invented any new types of neurotransmitters. They do epigenetics the same way we do, the same hormones, the same everything. They put their pants on one leg at a time the same way we do. Almost none of them had any indications beforehand that this was going to be someone capable of this sort of extraordinary change. So what I think we're left with here at the end is sort of an inversion of that like inevitable Santayana cliche of those who don't hunt and study history are destined to repeat it. What we have here I think is in fact quite the opposite. Those who don't study the history of astonishing human change and don't understand the science that begins to explain why to make that more likely, those of us who don't study that are destined not to be able to repeat moments like these. Uh, we came across a ditch. It had bodies in it, a lot of them. Women, kids, old men. I remember the thought going through my mind, how, how did these people get in a ditch? And I finally thought about the uh, uh, Nazis, I guess, and marching everybody down into the ditch and blowing them away. Here we are supposed to be the good guys in the white hats. It upset me. I admire you so much for your courage and your determination. And your story was so touching. Thank you, man. Thank you very much. Hugh Thompson was thinking about his family back home when his crew chief, Glenn Andriotta, saw a young child alive in the ditch. Thompson landed his chopper immediately, and Andriotta jumped out. Glenn, without hesitation, went into the ditch and waded over to the child, who was still... Ditch full of bodies? Yes, sir. No, it was full, sir. Uh, full of blood? Yes, sir. Some of the people were still... They were dying. They weren't all dead. And Glenn got to the child and picked him up, and it was a boy. I, I think it was a little boy, yes. I remember thinking that I had a son, you know, that same age. And uh, as Thompson was recalling the horrors of that day, an elderly woman walked toward us. She said that she had been dumped in the ditch back in 1968, but had survived, shielded by the bodies of the dead and dying. And he went to, to meet the Thompson, a good man. She wants to meet Mr. Yeah. Thompson. Well, here is Mr. Thompson. Very, very glad Hello, to meet you. Hello, ma'am. Nice to meet you. Sorry, sorry we couldn't help you that day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Do you know? Come here, me. Take some down. Why, she wanted to know, were so many villagers killed that day? And why was Thompson different from the rest of the Americans? Please. I, I saved the people because I wouldn't talk to murder and kill. I can't answer for the people who took part in it. And I apologize for the ones who did. I just wish we could have helped more people that day. In fact, they did help more people. Thompson and Colburn found ten villagers cowering in a bunker. They radioed for a couple of choppers, which airlifted all of them to safety. I'm so sorry. And we managed to find two of the women they'd saved. Mrs. Nung, who was 73 now, was 43 when she was rescued. Mrs. Nung was only six. You were very small then. You were at the entrance. This is Larry. This is Larry. He was with me that day. Thank you very much once again for your great help. Didn't you take your life in your hands, Hugh, when you got out and told the American soldiers who had been killing that they'd, they'd better quit and let these people get out of the bunker? If you won't answer that, Larry, didn't he? 
Yes, sir, he did. And he he didn't even take a weapon with him. He, he had a sidearm. He didn't even have it drawn. He just placed himself in harm's path. And I was thinking that uh, at that point anything could have happened. And we watched Mr. Thompson go to the bunker and and bring the people out. And, and you had seen all of these bodies before then, so that you knew what was going on. It was pretty obvious what was going to happen if he didn't take action when he did. And Well, what would have happened is that these two women would not have survived, and these children would not be here. What a sense of joy and satisfaction it must be for the two of you guys. There's a, a lot of joy, a lot of satisfaction, and a lot of hurt, too. Because, you know, I, I know the numbers that didn't make it, and it was, it was meaningless for the people that were taking part. There was just no value whatsoever in life. We drop a lot of bombs and then do a lot of talking and then we become friends. It seems to me that if we do the talking before the bombs start falling, then we can be friends also. These are my sources used with fair use under the U.S. copyright law for educational purposes.